welcome to our dad on the Jim Crespin Podcast. With me on the podcast today, we have Brighton Udy. He's got a very unique story. He was half of the uh, duo Leaving Thomas, the CCMA-nominated duo, Canadian Country Music Association-nominated duo. He also has a company called At Heart Creative, and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about that company today and how it could potentially help artists. Brighton, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Jim. It's my pleasure. So first things first, uh, we've seen an explosion of podcasts. Uh, I can't believe how many of my friends have podcasts, how many artists have podcasts, uh, which is all a positive thing. It gives everybody a voice. There's over a, well over a million podcasts now online. Absolutely. Um, I was reading some statistics the other day that you only need 500 downloads per episode to be in the top 1% of all existing podcasts. Um, which is crazy when you think about it, but that's sort of that, that price is law Pareto distribution, um, reality that occurs in music and sports and everything else. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about how your business has helped, uh, artists and entrepreneurs facilitate their brand strategies, uh, through the pandemic and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I started at heart focused on branding first, and I really believe in a brand first approach to any kind of marketing. Um, we originally started doing like brand strategies and logo creation and you know figuring out colors and typography and all of the aesthetic that goes along with brands. But my favorite part was the strategy piece. It's you know what does what does an organization or what does an artist, what does a brand stand for? What is their why? Who is their perfect customer? Really getting into the the weeds of of the strategy um, and the essence of the brand. I mean, that's why I called it at heart. It's like, what is the brand at heart? Um, and and that has really kind of led into content creation, and that's where we're really focusing now is is creating content for a brand that is really authentic to that brand. So whether it's an artist or whether it's a company, we're really focused on making sure that the content that we're creating for that brand resonates not only with you know the, the brand's standards and, and the brand's essence, but also resonates with their clients and their customers. What and, are some of the common mistakes and trappings of people who uh, launch a podcast and they're sort of yeah. crawling before they can run? <laughs> sorry, running before they can crawl. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes that you see out of the gate for people who get things rolling right away? I would say... I mean, one one of the things that I see is trying to do something too perfect. There's definitely something to be said about just starting. If you sit in a room with a friend and you go, let's start a podcast, all you have to do is hit record on your iPhone and you, you can start doing a podcast. I mean, Anchor, you use Anchor, I use Anchor. It's uh, Spotify's podcasting platform. You can actually record within the iPhone app and get that started. Um that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that I see is podcasting isn't that hard, but it's just a matter of starting and, and committing and being consistent. Um, the number of times I've seen people start anything, whether it's YouTube videos or podcasts, they, they do two or three and then they stop. Um, I, I know, I mean, we've had this conversation. It, it takes a while to start to build up that momentum, but if you can create a podcast once a week, for two years, you're actually going to start seeing some some exponential growth and be able to probably make a a, a, a business out of it um, j- just on its own. So, um, I mean, consistency is is a big piece. But uh, yeah, you, so you have to play the long game. And the old adage: "Good is the enemy of great. Perfection is the enemy of action." You know, it's like people get too caught up on on a vision for something, and it's like just start, learn as you go. Chances are no one's going to be paying it. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times our desire to achieve perfection out of the gate on something is somewhat tied to narcissism, right? It's like we're worried about how we will be perceived when the reality is at least we're taking action, at least we're starting and we can, you know, parry some criticism based on the reality that we're at least moving forward. Um, I think it's, I think it's important, though, to bring people in early to consult such as yourself 
Mm. Um, I also had Rory and AJ Vaden on the podcast yeah. and they also work in the brand space. And I know you're a fan of Rory's and his yeah, best New York times, best selling books. And, you know, th- they sort of have the same philosophy. It's like, it's not going to go well out of the gate. You got to play the long game. And then, and then something that I've experienced that, um, I found out very early on is, Unless you're doing live podcasts, it's good to get a bunch in the can so that you're always a little bit ahead of the game. Yeah. Um, I spoke to about five or six people who had done podcasts who had quit them and uh, podcasts that I admired and respected. And, and that was the common overarching reason. It was like, well, I got behind and then, you know, you take a week break and then a two week break and then it just becomes too easy not to come back to it, yeah. you know, and so, so that was one thing right away that I was like, okay, let's get six or seven in the can, release them weekly, and then I'm always a month ahead. Uh, yeah. It means your content is going to be a little less relevant if you're uh, focused on current events. But in the music industry, you know, you can you can get away with that a little bit. Oh, absolutely! I'm with you. We're we're revamping the the podcast that I started. We're cha- we're rebranding the whole thing, and I you were one of the first guests. So thanks for doing that. Um, but for at the heart of it, the podcast, we're just, we have six episodes recorded and we haven't even launched one yet. And it's again, just blitzing, trying to get as much recorded now so that we have that, that pipeline of content that will be just ready to flow. And every episode that start recording, it's, it's just adding, adding to that, uh, that consistency. So, um, yeah. And once you have some podcasts, you know, so again, I, I, Think about the community that listens to this podcast largely. It's a lot of artists, yep. and, and yep. I think it's an important branding piece for artists to have, especially who are skilled in that space. Mm-hmm. Once you get your episodes recorded, how do you recommend you roll out a plan to pre-promote it? Because that's also imperative. People need to be anticipating, excited, enthusiastic for the content. So you have to tease a little bit, just like you would yep. your music. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. If if you think of a podcast episode release like a single release but on a smaller scale that's probably the best example that that i can draw between between music and podcasting um i'm a firm believer and i know that you are as well as a a fellow gary v fan is following the pillar content model so that's honestly what's so great about podcasts is you can record one long piece of content and then break that down into smaller bite-sized pieces. I mean, you're going to see that everywhere, whether on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. You're going to see small clips of what is a longer episode, whether that be a YouTube show or a podcast. And the best way that I can recommend promoting that, especially early on, is find the most engaging piece or the, your favorite part of that episode. What was a quote, something somebody said that was really inspiring or empowering? What was a funny blooper that may have happened? Um, What was a story that someone hadn't ever told before? Um, Those pieces are what are most engaged with on socials, but are also the pieces that will actually pique someone's interest and make them want to listen to the full episode. and, And then you direct them there, whether it's in the caption or with a call to action at the end of that clip. Um, you want to start pointing them to that that full length episode. So it's it's not necessarily having to come up with something brand new and creative outside of the context of the episode. It's just using what you've recorded and what you've gotten in that episode and pulling out some bite sized pieces that people can engage with and and uh, you know would make them actually want to go listen to to the full episode. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you want to pre-promote it, but you also want to find a way to tap into the audience of your guest, which in some cases can be substantial. So what are some of the tips and tricks and hashtags that can be used, especially in uh, in the context of YouTube, where you can uh, not only preach to your own choir, but possibly um, uh, brand rub against mm. your guests audience as well to bring them in and over to your podcast. Yeah. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, one way that I think is really underrated is guesting on other people's podcasts. I mean, right now I'm really grateful that I'm able to chat with you right now because I I'm able to introduce myself to your audience and it was the same vice versa. You guessed it on at the heart of the podcast, which, you know, we'll be able to introduce you to our audience. 
Um, that's one of the best ways to brand rub. I mean, you're, you're seeing it in music now so much. Um, my release Friday or new release Friday, every Friday with Spotify, there's gotta be three, four songs where it's a duet with a, a, another artist. Um, I think it was, uh, I can't remember who it was Kelsey Ballerini did one recently with, uh, with a pop artist and she was able to kind of brand rub that way. It's very similar with podcasts where if you're able to guess on somebody else's podcast. That's awesome. Um, growth and, through collaboration. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's anchor actually has a really interesting, uh, tool within there that I want to try and explore with the, at the heart of it podcast is they actually have a section where people can record questions and submit them to the podcast. So you can actually put out a call to your, your audience and go, Hey, is there a question that you would like us to answer? Or is there something that you want to know? Or who would you like us to have on the show? Um, and they can submit their, their voice memo directly to the host. And then they can actually use that and insert it into the, the episode itself. Um, that's one way to, to interact with, with, uh, the audience and, and kind of get a better, uh, connection with, with yeah, almost audience. like a live call in show back Absolutely. in the old days on radio, right? Where you've got yeah. people calling in using their own voice, posing their own questions and you're, uh, splicing that into your podcast and, uh, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. How so, long has that feature existed? Uh, I think it's been a while. I mean, Spotify acquired Anchor a while ago. I don't know when they did it. Just one day I logged in, it was like, buy Spotify. And I was like, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe it was there before before they had done it. And I think it's relatively yeah. unique to, to Anchor. So if you're thinking of starting a podcast, I highly recommend using Anchor because it will distribute your your episodes to every major podcasting outlet um and it'll kind of host your rss feed which is the you know the technical <laughs> term of what the podcast actually is um but it's it's a great resource um and i was excited to to hear that you guys were using it as well because it is a really really great tool yeah it's it's uh anchor has, has done a great job for us i think another thing that we need to talk about philosophically is the power of why you know, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's a podcast or any initiative in your life. It's like, what is driving this? So I like to use the, the Tony Robbins uh, RPM strategy, which is R for result, P for purpose, M for massive action. You sort of like draw three columns, R, P, M, and then you, mm -hmm. you, you fill in those columns and then it, it, it helps guide your decision as to what the intent is behind it. Um, and I think, I think a lot of times with podcasts, especially when it comes to artists, they see other artists doing it. They feel like there's some sort of obligation for them to get into the space, right? but they're not really that interested in the content or they're not getting the results or the views that they were hoping or anticipating that they would get. They get disenfranchised, disenchanted, and they drop the whole thing. So Talk a little bit about how important it is to define that why out of the gate, and then we can get into your why and my why for the podcast, which may yeah. give some other people some ideas. 100%. It's a, it's a great point. And that's, again, kind of comes back to the whole brand strategy piece and that being so important is, is knowing what your why is. Um, for me personally, I had... A podcast previous, it was called the At Heart Branding Co. Podcast that I was trying to do a whole bunch of, you know, brand tips and marketing tips, and it felt disingenuous. I really didn't feel comfortable doing it, and I kept doing it for a while, and I I pulled the plug because there was another opportunity, and it kind of fell apart. So when I started thinking about how would I want to get back into doing this, and how would I want to approach it, and what was my why behind it, and for me why is such a powerful thing? I mean, that's, I named my company pretty much after the importance of, of being authentic and, and, um, you know, the, the focusing on the why. And that's where I just went, I want to make this fun for me. I want it to be enjoyable. Like if I enjoy it, then other people will enjoy it. And if I enjoy it, then I'm going to make sure that I do it all the time. And that focus being around getting to the root of other people's why, and why did they decide to to do what they're doing? Um, you, you know, what's the what's the motivation behind their professional careers or decisions that they've made in order to, you know, sacrifice one thing for the other? It's that to me is so fascinating. Um, 
and it and it really is is powerful. It's funny. I've got this book, which is um, your one word that I picked up not that long ago by Evan Carmichael, and he's a Canadian entrepreneur. And it is a really great read if you're trying to figure out what your why is, because he focuses on what is the one word that is going to kind of be the theme of your life. And I'm pretty sure Rory and uh, like Rory Vaden talks about that a little bit within the context of what is your one word for your brand, right? He talks about Dave Ramsey being debt and, and he kind of champions that word. Donald Miller champions story. Um, this kind of walks you through a very similar process where you go, well, what is, what is your one word and what is that going to be? What's your one word? My word is heart. <laughs> it was, it was something that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working through it right now. Um, and going through all the exercises. But for me, when I wrote down heart, it's, you know, listen to it, like always listen to your heart. It's always right. Use it, be kind and empathetic to others, have heart and, you know, harness your passion to change the world and follow your heart. It will lead you to where you're supposed to be. Like those are all things that I have felt through my experiences, whether it be, you know, pursuing a hockey career or pursuing a music career, or pursuing a career in marketing and creating creative content. Um, or I mean, find, like meeting my wife, like that's all been moments where it's, uh, it, it, it's kind of led me to where I was supposed to be. So that's, that's my word. And that's what I'm wanting to really start to implement in, into, you know, the podcast and, and all the work that, that I do moving forward. But yeah, it's a, boy, you got to be experience. so honest with yourself. You got to no be kidding. so like, that's where the self-awareness piece really comes in. And I think it is just, so easy to fool yourself or to build out mm-hmm. some sort of, um, you know, sort of like uh, virtue or moral idea for what you think you stand for, but really your motivating force is this other thing over here that isn't quite as virtuous. And so, you know, you you gravitate to the thing that makes you look better rather than the thing that's actually driving you. Like I think with artists, uh, and in industry people, there's a, there's a significance piece. We like to feel significant. We like to feel like, like we matter. And yeah. I know as it pertains to my own journey and starting this podcast, that was part of it. I mean, I've always been a bit of an attention whore, but I know that about myself. Right. But I also knew that, that there were a lot of artists out there, some of them at different levels, some people who've been at the game for years and, and others who are just starting out. And this is such a cryptic business where everyone wants to be paid for their relationships and their, their knowledge and understanding. And I, I, I'm not shitting on that. I understand why, but at the same time, I find that for me, this podcast gave me the opportunity to bring on experts, ask them questions from the perspective of people who might be struggling to gain more of an understanding for this business. And therefore they could glean something from it. Now, are my questions always perfect? No. Are the answers always perfect? No. But if you listen to enough content, eventually you're going to come out with more knowledge than you started with. And that's the point. Yeah. And then I also just, I, I feel like my day as a uh, promoter, manager, agent are a lot of compelling conversations. Mm-hmm. And I always used to say like, man, I wish there could be a fly on the wall for uh, this conversation because I think someone would really get something valuable out of it. And of course you have to protect some, some, uh, uh, you know, you can't, you can't be wide open on a podcast as much as you want to be authentic because there are some uh, business practices that need to be held a little closer to their chest. And then I understand that people might not want to talk about the intricacies of their label deal or their management yeah. deal or <laughs> their, their publishing deal. And I understand that, but if you can share enough that you give people an idea of what they should be looking for in their career and the standards that they should have, then I think we contribute to a better industry overall. And for me, that was the final result, the legacy piece where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of people out there flailing for information and this industry doesn't give it up easily. So no. what if we created a podcast and it was free and people could access it and all they have to do is deploy time. And if they, if they get something out of it, great. 
If they don't, it's not like I'm charging or funneling them into some sort of program to educate them on my version of what I think they should do in the music business. It's like, no, this is all different people, level, different levels of understanding. Have a listen if you want. If you don't get any value out of it, that's okay. There are other people yeah. out there who do. And, you know, you grow it methodically and slowly because of that, right? Yeah, 100%. And I, I wish that you had done this when I had started because <laughs> I, I left, you know, pursuing a professional career in hockey and I probably could have gotten a scholarship and stuff like that, fell out of love with, with the game. Um, and just went, you know, this is not where I'm supposed to be. One of the things I wanted to do was pursue a music career. It had always been something that was interesting to me. And um, the first thing I did was buy a ticket to the CCMAs and when they were in Edmonton. And that for me was, I want to absorb as much as I can about how the industry works. I knew nobody. It did like, I had no connections, just bought a ticket, went and shook hands and went to every single seminar to try and listen and learn. And like you said, the, the industry can be quite cryptic. Um, but people, there are people like yourself that want to share that. And I think it's incredibly valuable. Um, and I'm so glad that you're, that you're uh, kind of opening the door a little bit more. So, uh, so those young artists, can yeah, they, they want to understand. There are people who are well-intended and want to share. And there's also people who haven't shared because they just haven't had the opportunity to. And that, that's one thing I yeah. really found uh, to be fair to address the, the sort of the cryptic nature of the music industry is that, you know, you get a guy like Ron Kitchener on or Mike Denny or yep. Shannon McNeven. These guys would be happy to tell you the lessons they've learned and how hard things have been for them to sort of figure things out as they've um, risen up through the ranks in this industry. But they don't often get asked those questions by people who actually understand what they do. Yeah. So um, my unique experience in this business gave me the the ability to to ask you know some meaningful questions to some of those industry luminaries from the perspective of hey if i'm trying to learn uh from you know if i'm trying to learn uh you know from a it, it doesn't really matter where i'm starting whether i've been at this for 20 years or 10 years or five years or this is my first year i have an opportunity to get something out of this and um, and what I found was refreshingly that a lot of people will open up and share a lot, and that was a that was a beautiful thing to behold. It's like you know you sort of like draw these judgments in your mind about like oh man this industry is so you know nobody wants to share any knowledge and then it's like well no they haven't really been given an opportunity so if it's, you give them an true. opportunity they will share. Yeah, I mean your example of Mike Denny. Um, it's a kind of funny full circle story, but he was in one of the round tables in the first, the first year that I was at the CCMAs and got his card, um, obviously worked with, with Chad Brownlee and that's kind of how they started MDM and they did the, the whole house concert tour with him. And I sent Mike an email randomly because I got his card at the round tables and I said, how did you get like the house car concert thing set up with, with Chad? And he told me pretty much everything, how they set it up, like how they kind of coordinated radio like if also if you ask the right questions somebody is likely going to want to want to help like in my in my experience like yours if if you ask people typically want to help um and funny enough full circle we we ended up signing uh signing a deal with with mike four or five years later um when he discovered the the band on uh when he discovered leaving thomas on itunes so it's you know, you, you learn, you ask, you learn, you ask, you kind of continue to move forward. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's just so, it's just so cool to start to see, you know, the Megan Patrick's and, and, uh, you know, Mike Denny's and of the world start to be able to share their story because you're giving them that platform too. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> it's been fun for me too. Do you find that what you're doing now in the branding space still scratches your creative itch? So obviously you're, you know, you were a, a successful musician. Um, you had done well. You and Annika had been building, leaving Thomas for a while. You had some, some success at radio. Then eventually that dissipated. You moved into this, you followed your heart into it by the sounds of things. Yeah. Do you get what you need to out of this in terms of feeling like you're you're still engaging that creative um, component of yourself that's so important and defines you? 
Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite things is to be able to, to take a concept and start to transition that into reality. Um, it, it's, there's a, I draw a lot of parallels between songwriting and content creation in that way. I think of, you know, I'm, I'm not the best lyricist by any means. And that's why I was so great writing with Annika because she can just absolutely process lyrics like no other. Um, but for me, it was more, I have this concept, I have this idea, I have this core progression and I don't know how to get it to that next step. Um, where with content, it's, I, I can, I have this idea, I've got my team that I can pull together to go, how do we start to bring this vision and, and create, you know, that vision into a reality. Um, and I love that. Like, that's, that's what I love. Um, you know, I think for me, I, I started to fall out of love with music and I think part of that was because it started to feel a lot more like a job when for my whole life, it was an escape. It was an escape from school. I was able to, you know, learn a song on the piano and I was able to, you know, get back into homework as an example and feel, you know, rejuvenated and, and excited. And, um, and I started to, to lose that when it was, that's all we were doing all the time. Um, and it, don't get me wrong, it was it was so much fun, and I'm gonna definitely have some some FOMO when uh, you know I see everybody starting to go playing shows again, um, and I'll be fortunate enough to play a, a couple here and there just just with some friends. But it's it's now it's now fun, right? Like I've got a guitar in my office. I'll play you know probably once a day at least just to just to decompress a little bit. But um, that that's what's so amazing about marketing too is it is so creative. I get to work with, with musicians. I get to work, um, with artists. I get to work with producers and, and, you know, creating podcast tracks, um, videographers. I mean, we produced Annika and I pretty much produced the, uh, blame it on the neon video. I've been able to produce music videos and direct music videos for Bobby Wills. Um, it's, it's been, I, I just feel really fortunate to be able to uh, flex all these different creative muscles and, and be able just to jump head first into to something that I find interesting. Um, and I'm really grateful for, for the opportunity to, to do all, everything that I've been able to do at this point, whether it be, a I think it's, business. it's a great point you made and, and something that I talk about a lot with artists at all levels and industry people too, is, you know, nobody follows their head into the music business, no. right? It, it doesn't make sense <laughs> statistically yeah. to look at the music business and go, okay, this is how I'm going to make it. We all follow our heart mm -hmm. into the business. And then at some point we need to integrate uh, our mind more. And at some part or at some point, Oftentimes we become so swept up in the commerce, so swept up in the branding, so swept up in the business side of it that we really start to disconnect from the very reason that we got into the music industry in the first place. And I think that's one of the things that I'm very conscientious about is that I don't lose my ears of the fan. Right. And, and I've yeah. run into industry people who have done that. It's like they overanalyze and they're thinking so much about, you know, hashtags and branding and whether or not this song aligns. It's like, well, is it, is it a good song? Like, is it a song that you want to crank up and listen to with your windows rolled down as you're driving home? Cause that's a pretty good test. Is it a song that when the artist performs it live, you see people mouthing the words by the second verse, like that's a pretty good test. Right. And so many times in our industry, we get so, um, we get so much myopia, you know, my, yeah. my we get myopic, myopic. right. Yeah. We get very myopic <laughs> and it's like, we get caught up in our own minds of analysis on tracks instead of just listening to them the way we used to listen to music mm -hmm. before we worked in music. And, um, it's something that I have to re-engage every time I hear a demo from one of my clients. It's like, is this a song I like because I found it? Is this a song I like because I have a bias, a preconceived bias because I really like the writers and I know they have a great success rate? Is this a producer who sent this to me that I really admire? Um, or is this just a great fucking song that yeah. I am going to download myself as a fan and pay money for it, even though it actually came out on my label because I enjoy it so much. Yeah. That's the acid test. And, uh, 
And I think as an industry, we all need to remain very aware of that. I don't care if you're in radio, if you're an artist, if you're a musician, if you're a, a, a label head, an agent, a manager. It's like, do you love the products you promote? Are you enthusiastic about them? Because if you're not, you should probably find a way to recalibrate your excitement level or leave the business. Right. And yeah. so many artists that I've toured, especially um, – I won't mention any names because I don't want to, I don't want to come across over critical because I'm, I'm judging these people, but you know, I've, I've toured a lot of artists who have just had massive success, but at this point in their career, they're miserable and you can right. see it when they're on stage. You can see it when they're backstage, you can see that they barely have time for fans that every little thing annoys them. And I always do my best to try and, and, uh, almost uh, in a secretive manner, ask them the type of questions that might instigate or initiate the original feeling for why they fell into the business in the first place, right? <clears throat> almost manipulation, but it's like positive manipulation, <laughs> trying to reconnect their heartstrings to what they do for a living yeah. uh, by asking them the questions that might might bring them around to that mindset and go, yeah, you know what? I am fucking blessed and I am lucky. And I can't believe that my music has had this level of impact on people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you see that, you see a totally different individual arise out of the ashes of something that had become so bitter. It's a really, really great point. And uh, that is so true for i think so many pieces of the industries like so many parts of the industry where we we weren't in it again we were so fortunate to have the climb at the rate that we did you know like people will fight tooth and nail for 10 15 20 years to have a taste of what we were able to have with leaving Thomas and Annika and I talk about that all the time. I mean, we had, we had dinner with, uh, with the, the other, I think it was last week and we were talking about that. And, um, you know, there, there were even times in our short little stint there where, you know, it, you definitely lose sight of that. You lose sight of why you did it. You, you lose sight of, where that passion originally came from um and obviously this it's not always going to be easy there's you know tough travel schedules or you know you're you're not happy with how the single's performing a radio or um you know there's there's it's it, i think yeah. at the root of the the unhappiness in this industry it's the cancer of comparison right oh it's goodness, this idea absolutely. that you know, you're looking over your shoulder at what everybody else is doing and how did that person get that opportunity and why are they on that slot on the festival? And, you know, if you get too swept up in that, A, you're not paying attention to what you're doing. Your focus is no longer on your career. It's on everybody else. And social media, by the way, exacerbates this. It oh makes it goodness, even worse. It ever. Um, and, and B, you you fall into that trap of no longer enjoying it because you feel like you are entitled to what you're not receiving. It's like we all sort of have this mental blueprint for our life and our career path. And when the, the truth of the environment doesn't match our expectation internalized, that's when we often experience pain. You know, that's when we often feel the ego entitlement uh, creeping in and stealing the joy from a situation that really we should be very grateful for. So as an artist, how do you combat that? Like what tactics and strategies did you use? Because you're, you're, most artists are hyper competitive people and they're high performers and they yeah. want to kick everybody's <laughs> ass and leave them in the dust. And I understand that, but yeah. at some point you have to go, why am I here? why am I doing this? I'm on my own path. I know full well that this is more of a marathon than a sprint. Like what did you do to ground yourself when you would experience those situations where you were like, fuck, how did that person get that opportunity? And why don't we have it? It's, it's funny because I don't know if I have ever overly struggled with comparison all that much. I always I wasn't always, I wasn't like an outcast in school 
but like, I never had like a big group of friends. Like I was always really individualistic. I was the hockey player in the hockey program that was the lead in the musical. Like that was, that was me growing up and would compete in the talent show, but then, you know, would be friends with everybody in school. Um, and was never overly worried about what other people were doing. So for me, I found it not that difficult. I mean, we were in several competitions, didn't win any of them. Um, and I just went, Hey, I'm grateful for this opportunity. We met a lot of great people. And even though we may not have won the biggest check, we, you know, were able to, to keep pushing the career forward. Um, for Annika, this is where I think we definitely were able to balance each other out really, really well was she is incredibly competitive, which I love about her. And is just always hungry, wanting to be top of the top. Um, and, and so for us to have that balance together where I'm more, let's do this for us. Like let's, you know, let's, let's release the song that resonates most with us. Um, and we think will resonate with the fans, not release a song based on what another duo has released because that's going to play different at radio. Like, um, but then to have her kind of continue to push me and go, well, you know, there's some competition in the industry. Like it's a good thing. Um, but for me, like, I, again, growing up, you talk about Tony Robbins. Uh, my dad threw me on the Tony Robbins train really, really early. Uh, I had the cassette tapes that I would listen to on the way to, to high school. Um, and the whole concept of reframing, I think, is really, really important and, again, really undervalued. So explain that a little bit for people who don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. So ultimately, reframing is just changing your perspective on a situation um example i mean there's still music contests all over the place and if you're in a talent contest or music contest you don't make it to the finals or you don't win the contest um you can either look at it as it's unfair and they aren't as good as you and or or you're terrible and that's why you didn't make it um all of that thought process is in your control. You can control 100% how you how you perceive the situation. So it's a matter of just shifting your perspective and reframing the situation and going, well, I met people through this competition that I wouldn't have met. I, I have been able to develop relationships with professionals that really know what they're doing um, and they could help me move my career forward. I mean, the, the examples run everywhere from people that don't win music competitions to be being top selling artists around the world. Right. You have hockey players that are drafted in the eighth round that become all stars and win Stanley cups. Like it's everywhere, but you're in control of your perspective. Um, and, and, uh, the way you perceive a situation. So that's always been important yeah. to, to me. I remember, a. a a story that really drove it home with me. And I think it was, I think it was at a Tony Robbins seminar where he, where he talked about um, a guy who was driving home with his family, ran into a traffic jam. He sort of had a, an adult meltdown was really upset that his day had been screwed over by the fact that he was 45 minutes delayed. But by the time they got home, they realized that there had been a, a break in at their house and a home invasion. And, um, and had they been there, uh, those same criminals had actually killed other people in their houses and that him getting that 45 minute traffic delay may have saved his life and saved his family's life. And it's, it's, I mean, that's obviously a very drastic, uh, Dramatic example, example, yeah, but it's a good example to get your head around the concept of glass half full, glass half empty. We, I mean, we hear these things all the time, but we don't really sit down and think about what they mean. And, you know, even catching yourself when you get caught at a red light and going, you know, maybe that red light saved my life. Like maybe I would have gotten T-boned had I sailed, you know, through on a green light because somebody may have come along or, you know, you just never know why things are functioning the way they are. So rather than, resisting everything which is exhausting by the way yeah. uh you get this opportunity to sort of surrender and welcome every experience as it encounters you and integrates into your life 
And I heard this other thing recently listening to Marcus Aubrey or Aubrey Marcus um, is his name. Uh, and I thought it was just so poignant and, and it pertains so much to people who are in your industry or my industry or the music industry. And he said, there are really only two motivational forces in this world. One is inspiration and the other one is desperation. Mm -hmm. And if you are always driven by desperation, you're going to always feel like you're being pushed and you're going to be pushing back naturally. You're going to be tired all the time. And you're going to always feel like you're reacting to everything in your life. If you are pulled by inspiration, then you have endless amounts of energy or near to it. And you're excited and enthusiastic and laying out plans and feeling like you're in control. And when you talk about reframing, I think, I think about the drastic examples, but I also think like at some point you have to decide if you're going to, if you're going to have a career or a life that is driven by either inspiration or desperation, right? And really the people who are sense. driven by desperation, they usually get exploited by the shitheads in our industry that can identify those people quite early and go after them and sign them up to these ridiculous contracts. And the people who are driven by inspiration have a set of standards um, that rarely allow them to get sucked into uh, an industry relationship that they're unhappy with. And um, I mean, I think you need a little desperation sometimes. I'm not saying that it's totally invalid. Yeah. Uh, it can force better habits out of us. I mean, if, if you're a person who hates exercise and you have a heart attack and your doctor says, listen, if you don't exercise, you're going to die. Well, that's a desperation move, but it may evoke a motivation within you to get your gym in the ass or get your ass in the gym every morning. And some of us need that sometimes depending on what we're trying to do and what our goals are. So I don't want to invalidate desperation, but by and large, it is so much easier to live an inspired life. I'm a hundred percent with you. I think uh, Tony Robbins also talks about, I think is you can't be angry and grateful at the same time. And Every morning, I write down three things I'm grateful for. If it's if it's clean water, it's clean water. If it's you know this technology that surrounds me, it's that. It can be anything, but um, you know, it, I think I probably said grateful or or you know, uh, lucky to to be to have the career that we did. Um, and I truly believe that that's how I saw it every single time. It's like, we were, we were top three at top of the country. We didn't win, but we were able to be in front of the entire industry at the CCMAs and, and perform a 20 minute set. And I, and we thought we crushed it, which we did. And even though we didn't win, we were able to make an impression on, on, uh, on the industry in that way. And to me, that is, just as important as you know the $25,000 check that can help you in your career like it's it's those type of things if you can approach it in a way of man I'm grateful for this opportunity um it's pretty tough to be to be pissed off and, and mad I mean obviously you want to have some level of of uh, competitiveness and and drive but at the same time it's you know it's uh, that, that's one of my my whole focuses is life is just, Hey, we live in Canada. We live in a great country. <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we've we've hit the lottery. I, I, you yeah, know, I struggle a lot with um, the ingratitude of of culture and society at times because I feel like we lose sight a little bit. And listen, like we have a lot of work to do to continue to improve things and keep things on a trajectory where there's more quality and 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 people are are evaluated based on their character and, and not so much their immutable characteristics, but the things about themselves that are really redeeming. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've also, we're also living in an incredible time, no you know, kidding. I mean, there's, there's nothing to say that I couldn't have been born or you couldn't have been born 200 years ago or a thousand years ago or 5,000 years ago, you'd have the same brain, the same body, and you would have a much different life and existence. And, you know, I think that, that 
we all have to be very cognizant of that, not only in our career and in our families, but, you know, on a societal level, it's like, yeah, things are not perfect and we got work to do and we are all going to be motivated and inspired to do that work if we pull together from a place of gratitude for what we already have rather than a place of pure resentment for what's been built so far. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, it's not a popular message right now. It's much more popular to want to tear things down. And, and I understand yeah. that to some degree that's valid, but, but you know, things I mean, could yeah, be worse. Absolutely. Have you ever, it's also, it's, it's a, the past is the past to, to a certain degree too. And you got to learn from it. You got to learn. Yes. From it. You don't want to repeat history. Um, if, if yeah. And I think, bad. I think judgment's a big part of that. Like I was thinking about this concept today um, as it pertains to the, the, obviously the atrocities around the residential schools. And yeah. um, my question wasn't how dare they, it was how was this sold to people? Like how did the government and the propaganda forces that existed at that time convince people this was a good idea? That's the question, because that's what we can learn from and watch out for moving forward. Because, yep. you know, I mean, uh, I'm going to say something really controversial here, but but I think it's important to understand the other side of it. I am not an anti-vaxxer. I've gotten plenty of vaccines in my life, but we are using, in, in some cases, an RNA technology, which is by virtue of the man who invented it, Dr. Malone, a bit experimental. Um, and he's been pulled off Twitter and YouTube for saying as much. Uh, the first places we went and did vaccinations were on a lot of uh, uh, reserves uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of indigenous people. We put them first on the list because we thought we were doing something really good. And probably we are. And probably the vaccine will end up, you know, a, a net benefit overall. But if we're wrong, if in five years we find out it has an effect on people that isn't positive, there will be a judgment in 50 or 100 years of our generation of how dare they experiment on indigenous people and how dare they, how did anyone allow that to happen? Mm. That's an important thing to remember as we forge forward in society to be able to think critically and ask questions and, you know, I mean, again, I want to reiterate this so that nobody takes this out of context. I think the net benefit of the vaccine distribution will be positive. But if we're fucking wrong, this is bad and we will be judged for this. And I am I guarantee you there were people at the turn of the century who for some corrupted thought belief structure thought that residential schools were going to be a good thing. I'm sure it wasn't all racist bastards you know, trying to trying to pull together these institutions that they knew would be um, uh, the homes of atrocities. I'm sure there were people who were well intentioned. It's like I want to know what those people thought. I want to know what their argument was for this, because yeah. then we can start to unwind where this might come up in the future, right? And that Absolutely. that's a really uncomfortable discussion to have these days. But you got to have them. No kidding. I 100% agree. I mean, this is like the furthest extreme probably of this conversation is Nazi, Nazi Germany. But my wife and I went to, uh, we went to Auschwitz. We went to Berlin. We're just very fascinated with how World War II happened. Like it's just such a fascinating time in history. And after visiting the uh, museum in Berlin, you actually start to see how it started to get to that point. It wasn't immediate. We're throwing people in concentration camps either. It was just, you know, it's, it's small incremental changes that start to, to start to ramp up. And it's, it is something that um, to me, sometimes this is scary in the sense of if you don't believe in something that you're reading online and you speak up about it, the, the whole cancel culture about some of that stuff of, you know, the one side is right, the other side is wrong. There's no middle conversation. Is is the the stuff that's that's frustrating and scary. And I mean, hindsight is always twenty twenty. So, like you said, 
50 years from now, we may be looking at the time now of even going, maybe lockdowns were the worst thing that we could have ever done. Maybe the vaccine is the worst thing that we could have ever done. But who knows right now, we're making the best decisions that we can <laughs> in the yeah, moment. Yeah, and I think critical so, thinking yeah. uh, and the ability to ask poignant questions is the only antidote to an unintended atrocity, right? I mean, uh, do I think that there were a lot of people in Germany in the, in the late 1930s who were doing terrible things in the name of what they believed to be virtue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, unfortunately, I think that there were people who thought they were doing something good, even though looking back on it, it's like, how the fuck could anyone think that? But yeah. you see it in society today where, where, you know, sometimes movements get a lot of momentum behind them and people get on board and they're not really, they don't really understand the issue and they haven't researched the other side of it. And then you see that momentum get more and more steam and suddenly it gets away on you a little bit. And it's like, yeah, you can understand how these things are initiated and propagated and manipulated by people who are in positions where they know where it's headed, but they're not, they're not giving people the full picture right from the beginning because they know that they would never support it. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. We, we look back on this time of COVID when we look back on this time of of the lockdowns and some of the measures we took. And God, I just hope we learned something from it. You know, um, I've talked about this before on the podcast. Like we were all so certain that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We were all so certain that whatever, li whatever leader would lie on the other side of Saddam Hussein would be better than what was there currently. And if you spoke out against the war or if you spoke out about, uh, again, out against the intelligence that was being gathered at the time. It was, you don't support the troops and how dare you be so unpatriotic. And it was cancel culture from the right. Yeah. And it was disgusting. And now looking back, you know, it's like we were wrong and, and there's over a dead million civilians in Iraq as a, as collateral damage for that decision, that foreign policy decision made by the United States and, and the allies. So yeah, it's important to ask questions and not get swept up in these movements. And I don't care if they're on the right side or the left side of the political spectrum. I just, I want people to be able to, to think about things, ask questions. And listen, if we're functioning from the place of, of making the best decisions we can based on the information we have at the time, then fair enough, we can defend that in the future. But if we're not, and we're we're going to be judged by future generations, and yeah. it's it's worth paying attention to those things. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. I didn't <laughs> plan right. on going that. I was going to say we rabbit hold a little bit there, but uh, yeah, no, it, that's how these things go. No, absolutely. But again, I the full circle piece of this the the gratitude can be so powerful through yes. through those those times of frustration whether it be in your career or just in life in general um and starting from from that place uh, to to me is is where you're gonna it's start to actually see a lot tool. more and you're gonna see more opportunity because you're it's y y your eyes are open to the things that that uh that can be an opportunity instead of instead of a problem too so yeah if you're focused on money or fame then it's a very tight window and you will miss so much outside of that window, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's often something that I try and preach to artists who are starting out. It's like, listen, I know you want to be rich and famous, of course, you know, but don't look at every situation, every opportunity through that lens exclusively, because it will blind you to situations that may four five, six, seven steps down the road have a, a massive benefit to your career. Right. Because you'll be so focused on what you can obtain short term that you will miss thinking through the long term benefits of, of an opportunity that might be afforded to you that you'll look at and go, well, this doesn't align with my vision and it's not going to be making me richer or famous overnight. So I'm not going to do it. It's like, yeah, yeah, OK, fair enough. But had you taken that opportunity, maybe three steps down the road, you would have actually benefited from it in a manner that 
is so much beyond your wildest expectations. So yeah, it's an important lesson to glean. And uh, Brighton, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's been almost an hour here, so I want to yeah. get things wrapped up. But um, appreciate you at Heart me. Creative, where do people find you? Yeah, so you can find us on at heartcreative.com. Um, we've rebranded all of our social media to at heart creative. Um, and the podcast will be coming out, which is called at the heart of it with bright and beauty. So that will be coming out uh, here shortly and you'll be able to find it. Spotify, Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, Stitcher, wherever, wherever you find your podcasts. Um, and if you want to find me personally, my, uh, social media is at bright and beauty. So that's, uh, Pretty much all the ways that you could find it. B-R-Y-T-O-N-U-D-Y. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks again for doing this, brother. Appreciate you. Thanks so much, Jim.